So here is a GCSE Maths Higher Edexcel Paper 3. So question number one, simplify n cubed times n to the 5, that's just going to be n to the 8 because we add the powers. Simplify this fraction. Now as you can see, when we divide powers, they will subtract from each other. It's just going to be c on top. And we also have d to the 4 divided by d, so that's just going to be d cubed. Solve 5x over 2 is greater than 7. So we want to multiply up the 2. And then we just divide it by 5 and leave it as our final fraction. Andy cycles a distance of 30 kilometers at an average speed of 24 kilometers an hour. He then runs a distance of 12 kilometers at an average speed of 8 kilometers an hour. Work out the total time Andy takes. So we know that speed equals distance over time, but in this situation we want time is distance over speed. So we can rearrange that using the triangle or however you want to. Now we take the 30, divide it by the 24, and that's going to give us 1.25. We do the same. For the running, which is 12 kilometers divided by 8 kilometers an hour, and that's 1.5 hours, so an hour and a half. Then we add together those two times, and that's just going to be 2 hours and 45 minutes. A number is rounded to one decimal place, the result is 9.4, complete the error interval for m. So the lower bound is going to be 9.35, the upper bound 9.45. That's quite a general question. Question 4, quite a long one here, so we've got grass seed needed to cover a rectangular lawn 5 by 9. That means the area of the lawn is going to be 45 metres squared. 45 metres squared needs 3 kilograms of grass seed to cover it. So what we ultimately want to do here is work out how much 1 kilogram of grass seed covers and then find out if it fits Maisie's lawn. So we work out that one. 10 times 14 is going to be 140 and she has 5 boxes of grass seed which corresponds to 10 kilograms. Now if 1 kilogram covers 15 metres squared then 10 kilograms is going to cover 150 square meters. So because Maisie has 150 meters squared worth, but only 140 meters square garden, then she has enough. Now when Maisie opens the five boxes of grass seed, she finds that four of them contain two, but one of them only contains one kilogram. So now she has nine kilograms of grass seed. Nine kilograms of grass seed is going to correspond to 135 meters squared. As her garden is 140, she now does not have enough. Question five, this is literally just filling in the probability trees. So the probability of landing on two is just going to be one in three. So the probability of not landing on two is going to be two in three. And this is repeated exactly the same for spinner B. It will be a third, two thirds, a third and two thirds. When we have to work out joint probabilities, I highly recommend highlighting the branches that we have to go through. So as you can see, we go up to land on two and then down to does not land on two. And then we want to multiply both of those fractions together. So one third times two thirds is going to be two over nine. Solving simultaneous equations using a graph is the easiest thing and you should definitely get marks on this. It is literally the coordinate that they intersect each other. So here, minus two and four. The same with the roots. So part B of this question, when it is equal to zero, we literally find where it intercepts the x axis because that is where the y coordinate is equal to zero hence y is equal to zero. So the x values here are going to be 3.4 and 0 0.6. Question number seven, 45 boys and girls. We are told the mean of both the boys and the girls. The trick here, we want to do the mean, but in reverse. So we multiply the numbers together to get the sum of the boys' ages. So 291.6, do the same for the girls, add them together. That's going to get the total sum of all the people's ages. And that goes to 742.5 if we use our calculator. And then the mean of that is going to be the sum divided by how many? So 45. And that comes to 16.5 years. And as you can see, that fits nicely in between the 16.2 and the 16.7. Classic probability one. If you haven't got confident with these, I would highly recommend doing this. So in a probability table, all of the probabilities should add up to one. So 0 0.32 add 0 0.2 is 0 0.52. Take this away from 1 and we're going to get 0 0.48. Now because the probability of getting red is 5 times the probability of getting yellow, we almost want to share the 0 0.48 in the ratio 5 to 1. So divide it by 6, one part towards the yellow, which is 0 0.08, and the rest of it towards the red, which will be 0 0.4. If there are 300 counters in the bag, the number of yellow counters is ultimately going to be 8% of that 300. So we find 8% using our calculator and we get 24 yellow counters. Question number nine. We have a prism, a complicated looking prism. 
To get a prism, to get the volume of a prism, we ultimately want to do the cross-sectional area times by the depth. In, in this case, the depth is 20. Now, the rectangle at the front, we have 12 times 10, so 120. The hard part of this is working out the area of that triangle because we're not told the height. However, we can use trig, normal trig, to just work out the height of that front triangle. So using tan, we have the opposite and the adjacent, the 5 being the adjacent, so we write it out, tan of 40 equals the opposite over 5, which is the adjacent. Multiply the 5 up, put it into our calculator, and we get the height is 4.195. So we do half times base times height to get our area, and that comes to 20.977. We add that to the original rectangle, which was 120, and that's going to get us 140.977. And then we want to times that by the depth, because that's the total cross-sectional area, and that is going to get us our final answer. Question 10. A person's heart beats approximately 10 to the 5 times a day, so almost like 100,000. And we have to work out how many times it beats in a lifetime, taking the average lifetime of 81 years. So 10 to the 5 times 365 will be one year, times that by 81. We put it in our calculator and it gives us the whole number. It gives us the whole 2.9 billion, basically. And then putting that in standard form to two significant figures is going to be 3.0 times 10 to the 9. A similar kind of question with the standard form. 2 times 10 to the 12 is going to equal 90 grams. And we want to work out 1. So because we are dividing by 2 times 10 to the 12 on the left-hand side, we need to do that to the right-hand side, put it in the calculator, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 11. Transformations, question number 11. So we want to do our first transformation, rotating 180 degrees around the origin. And all I would do here, so you see it goes 1 across and 2 up from the origin, so we want to do that the opposite side to get the triangle Q. And then we want to translate that across the vector 5 minus 2. So 5 to the right, that'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 2 down. And then we just redraw the triangle there. Because the translation does not actually make the shape look any different. It's just moving it, like picking it up and moving it. Now from P to R, it's a tricky one to spot. But it is a rotation here. And it's a rotation of 180 degrees. What I highly recommend, because it's not easy to often see the point at which it's rotated around. So if you draw the lines just like I'm doing here, it makes it a lot easier because where they intersect will be the point that it has been rotated around. So you would just put into your answer around 2.5 minus 1. Under the transformation, point A is invariant. So in this case, the point that is invariant, invariant means it doesn't change. So the point that doesn't change is actually that turning point of 2.5 minus 1. This is a difficult one, algebraic fractions. So x over x plus 2 plus 2x over x minus 4. What we want to do here is we're finding a common denominator by multiplying the x plus 2 and the x minus 4. And then we cross multiply, so we're multiplying the x minus 4 up to the x and the x plus 2 up to the 2x. We then want to expand all of that out, so we just do normal claw method to get x times x, x times minus 4, and then the same for 2x and x, and then 2x and 2, and then keep our denominator underneath as usual. And then if we collect all the like terms, you'll notice that the minus 4x and the positive 4x will cancel out, leaving us with 3x squared over the x plus 2, x plus 4 on the denominator. When expanding and simplifying a triple bracket, at first ignore the third one, Focus on the double bracket because you are probably confident with the double bracket. So if we expand that out using the normal double claw method, we're going to get 2x squared. The x co coefficients will cancel down a bit to make minus 3x and then minus 9. We want to then introduce that final third bracket. And then this time we kind of want to have a triple claw going on. So we do 2x squared times 4x, 2x squared times the 5, as you can see I'm doing here. And then once we do all of that, it should look something like this at the end of it. And then just like before, we want to cancel down all our results to get this as our final answer. So here is a question on inequality regions. So all we want to do is plot the inequalities on here. Now, one thing to notice with these is because they're all equal to, as well as they're less than or greater than, then they are solid lines. So the points on those lines are still counted as within that region. If it's not equal to, you would do a dotted line or like a not solid line, basically. And typically, as a rule of thumb, 
If it is a diagonal line and it's less than, it's normally going to be under that line. And if it's greater than, it's going to just be above that line to make it a bit easier for you. Now, that final one is a bit tricky because we have to rearrange it to get it in the normal y equals mx plus c. We find the y-intercept at plus 2. And because it's minus 2 over 3, that means for every 3 we go across, we're going 2 down, which is how I plotted this one. If you are really stuck, use my calculator tricks video and you can find out how to plot any line just by using your calculator. And that would be our shaded region and they normally want you to label it R or whatever letter they suggest in the question. We have a part B as well. So as you can see in this, all the inequalities are equal to as well as like less than or greater than. And the 0.24 that Jeffrey here is asking about lies on the line. But because all these inequalities are equal to as well as greater than or equal, as well as greater than or less than, then the 0.24 counts as being within that region, basically. Question number 14, we have some circle theorems going on here. And it's quite a complicated one, I must admit. So one thing I noticed straight away here was that we have a cyclic quadrilateral. So BDEF has all its corners on the circumference of the circle. So opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral add up to 180. So the other one is 80. Using the alternate segment theorem, angle CBF is going to be 40 as well. And then we add them up, take them away from 180, and we get our answer of 60. Recurring decimals into fractions are normally really nice questions, so make sure you know these really well going into your final exam. So you do the normal steps of x equals 0 0.7333 and so on, times it by 10, times it by 100, until you get the decimal portion to be exactly the same. Once we have that, we want to take them away. So 100x take away 10x is going to be 90x, and then we do the 73 take away 7 to get our 66 in this case. We bring the 90 underneath, 66 over 90 cancels down to 11 over 15 if we divide it by 6. Again, you can do all of that on your calculator as well, just to double check it. Work out an estimate for the distance the car travelled in the first 30 seconds. The distance on a speed time graph is going to be the area under the graph, which is why I've drawn a triangle here. Base times height, divide it by 2, and our distance is going to be 135 metres. Is it an underestimate or an overestimate? It's going to be an underestimate here because our area doesn't quite cover everything under the curve. It's a straight line on the triangle, but a curved graph. So we do miss out a small portion. And for this one as well, what they've done is they've worked out the average acceleration across the first 60 seconds, whereas you would need to draw a tangent to get it at 60 seconds. Now, this is a really tricky question. So we have a histogram and we want to work out the mean distance. So ultimately, we want to treat it like a grouped frequency table, because technically histograms come from grouped frequency tables. So the class widths, we want to get the midpoints of them. So I write my 6.8, the 7.4, 7.8, and 8.1, as you can see on the left-hand column there. And the frequency, we would calculate the area of each of those bars. So the class width times the frequency density, ultimately. So we have 8 for the first one. We're going to get 20 for the second one. 40 for the third, and then 12 for the final one. Write them all down. We want to times those across, so frequency times the midpoint. This is just exactly like adding up all of your values before dividing them by how many you have. So I've, add, I've multiplied all those up. If we add them together, we're going to get 611.6. .6. And then because there's 80 of them in total, we divide by 80, and we get our mean of 7.645. Question number 18, AH equals 11.3 correct to the nearest millimetre. Now, because that is near to the nearest millimetre and we want to calculate the lower bound, then the lower bound of AH to nearest millimetre would be 11.25. So that's what we put there. Now, when you're doing 3D Pythagoras, there is a slightly different equation. You actually would do A squared plus B squared plus C squared equals D squared because the diagonal, you can try it for yourself, when you do AF and FH, they're not going to be exactly the same because FH is on the diagonal. So we want to do X squared plus X squared plus X squared. Because it's a cube, they're all going to be identical. So we set that up as an equation. We have 3X squared equals the 11.25 squared, which is 126.5625. Divide it by 3 and then square root it. And our final answer is going to be the 6.495. Question 19, 
For those of you that were scarred from the hexagons in the last paper, you probably won't like the look of this one either. It is actually very similar. So we are told that the side length of the smaller hexagon is X. So I'm just going ahead and labeling X. And what I notice I can do here is draw a load of triangles and they coincidentally end up being equilateral triangles. Because if I work out the interior angles of a hexagon, I use the formula n minus 2, where n is the number of sides, times that by 180, and I'm going to get 720 here. So that means all of the angles combined make 720. And if there's six of them, divide it by six, and I'm going to get 120 for each one. Because those straight lines will split them equally, there's going to be 60 for every single angle. So all of those triangles must be equilaterals. I then go ahead and want to use the half a, b, sin, c equation, which you are given in your formula sheet. So I would do half times x squared times sine of 60. Pop that in the calculator, and it's going to be root 3 over 4 x squared. Now, because there are six of those equilateral triangles, we want to multiply that by six. So it's going to be six root 3 over 4. And you'll see later on this can cancel down. But again, in total, that's now going to be 6 root 3 over 4 x squared. We know the scale factor for the bigger hexagon is p. So the area scale factor is going to be p squared, because that's how the scale factors work in similar shapes. So the area of the big hexagon is going to be the smaller hexagon times by p squared, as you can see that I've written here. So the shaded area is going to be the big hexagon, take away the little hexagon. And as you can see, I've cancelled the fraction here to 3 root 3 over 2 and we get exactly what they required of us in the question. Question number 20. Here is a list of five numbers. Find the lowest common multiple of these five numbers. Now, because they are all in the 98 times table, technically, because it's just 98 times 98 times 98, basically, and so on. So the lowest common multiple has to be the biggest one out of all of them, because 98 to the 91 is not going to fit into 98 to the 53 but 98 to the 53 will fit into 98 to the 91. So that has to be the lowest common multiple. Question 21. You basically want to get something C equals something D. And it does sound a bit counterintuitive at the time. So 4C equals 3D. So what does C and D both have to be so that they equal the same thing? And basically, we just want to make them both 12 because 4 and 3 both go into 12. So C would have to be 3, D is 4, so 3 to 4. The same for this one, although it's a little bit harder. So we have a combination of x's and y's here. So if we go ahead and divide by the y squared, then it's going to create a consistent constant that we can turn into a nice looking quadratic. So if we let p, or any letter, equal the x over y, then that is going to become 6p squared minus 7p minus 20 equals 0. And then we can factorise this as normal. So we're going to have 3 in the first bracket, 2 in the second bracket. And then we can find that minus 5 is going to go in the right bracket and plus 4 is going to go in the left bracket. Again, worst case, you could do some quadratic formula and you would get your answers that way. Because x and y both have to be greater than 0, it can't be the bracket on the left, so it has to be this one. So we turn our p back into x over y, and with a bit of rearranging, we're going to get 2x equals 5y. And for the same reasoning before, x is going to be 5, y is going to be 2, so it's going to be 5 to 2. And that sums up the entire paper. Thank you very much for watching and I hope this helped.